Hello, my friends, and welcome to Fishery. Great to have you back as always, and today we are diving in deep to talk about a brand new discovery that rewrites a chapter of aquatic evolution. A newly studied fossil that was recently found has revolutionized our understanding of how the world's most successful freshwater fish came to be. Thanks to brand new research done using several amazingly well-preserved fossils, we are now able to reconstruct even the most delicate features and details of ancient organisms using brand new MRI and computer modeling technology. So let's explore this new study and academic journal article, and let's talk about how ancient ocean-dwelling fish made their first big splash into fresh water. We once thought it occurred around 158 million years ago, and only once. However, our recently newly discovered fossils and thinking on the matter completely blow that thinking apart and move the date up by 70 million years and say that it was not just one event, but perhaps many, if not at least two or three. So why are we looking at fish fossils and what were we doing to discover this? Well, fish need to hear underwater and they have developed incredible hearing and a diversity of ways to hear things and to feel pressure underwater, both directionally and high frequency, low frequency, uh, quick, long, you name it. So tens of thousands of species have a fascinating ability, specifically in freshwater, to hear frequencies and sound, as well as minute changes in the water pressure surrounding them that ocean-dwelling fish cannot sense. So first of all, we need a little background on all this. Most fish we see in rivers, lakes, and streams today belong to a group of fish that we call the autophysian fish. This includes catfish, tetras, minnows, uh, zebra fish, uh, corridoras, and many of today's popular freshwater aquarium species that you know and love. But as I mentioned, these species all share a special hearing system we call the Weberian uh, apparatus. And I'm sorry if I'm kind of butchering it for me, Weberian or Weberian, Web, Weberian, like Webster's Dictionary, guys. Uh, it's hard to say quickly. Weberian apparatus. Uh, it is a series of tiny bones connected to the air bladder and the inner ear of fish that give them the enhanced hearing ability to hear high frequency sounds and sensory data uh, from different pressures of water than the oceanic fish can hear. And this is 70% of all the freshwater fish species that exist. So if we look at the best fossil we have of this sensory apparatus, the Weberian sensory apparatus, and we go back as far as we can in the fossil record, it brings us to a specimen up in Canada named Acronyxes macacogenoi. And I butchered that name, I'm sure, but this specimen dates around 67 million years ago. And that is the late Cretaceous period, right before the dinosaurs were vaporized uh, permanently. And what makes this fossil really special is that it has such detail in that preserved Weberian apparatus that's been fossilized that the tiny bones known as ossicles that link that air bladder to the fish's inner ear have all been preserved absolutely perfectly. And now using 3D scans that can actually penetrate the stone without ripping it apart, we can look at it literally by the tenth of a millimeter, layer by layer, density by density, and make out 3D renderings of what is happening in that stone, just like as if the fish were living. And through digital modeling, we can then turn these organs and bones and things into actual different materials with different properties, such as vibrations or frequencies, different, uh, you know, hearing attributes uh, for how we see today's animals hearing. And we can then overlay that to what we're seeing in the fossil record. And when we look at this fish 67 million years ago, we realize that they've already adapted almost identical hearing uh, 
organs and sensing as modern day freshwater fish, even while dinosaurs were still roaming the earth. So this pushes back and complicates the timeline of when freshwater fish first appear, or that is to say, when super successful groups of freshwater fish made multiple attempts, as well as a few freshwater fish without this hearing organ that also entered freshwater around this time, made it into fresh water from the oceans. As we know it now, life probably began in fresh water or mineral rich springs or pools or, or ponds, and over time then made it to salt water, then to land, then fresh water, and in some cases back to land or back to salt water. If we're talking about whales or, you know, mammals and other things, let's quickly address why hearing is so important, especially for fish, right? So in aquatic environments, sound travels very differently than on land and through open air. And hearing can be a massive survival advantage as it impacts everything from predation evasion to coast-specific species communication, everything from navigation uh, and spawning uh, behavior to finding spawning environments to intercepting prey. So it's important stuff and it needs to be tuned for the size of the environment and the things in the environment as, as much as, uh, you know, what you're hearing, you need to know also, you know, the space, the size, how sound travels, and also the properties of how quickly that sound travels through salt water, hard water, soft water. All these things have an impact on how the fish will then electronically and neurologically map this in their brains, which is absolutely fascinating. And the fact that we can reconstruct this in computers is even more mind blowing to me. But most marine fish are limited to hearing only uh, sounds up to around 200 hertz. And that's because they rely on different mechanisms than the one we were speaking of earlier today, the Weberian uh, apparatus. Those fish have a lateral line and they have a, an ability to sense pressure through the water, but the advent of the swim bladder with the Weberian apparatus uh, and these little bones actually allow them to have almost several eardrums, and it's like hearing in 4D or hearing in 3D, and rather than being able to kind of know where something came from, they can actually understand the size of things. They can kind of use it like radar or mapping, echolocation, and we later see in living fish that they have their visual cortex in actual operation while they're hearing and sensing pressure changes and in their uh, the parts of their brain that are associated with sound and pressure they're actually the same part and, and they're all linked to movement and visual awareness so it's all mapping in real time in a way that humans don't do humans can't even perceive what it would be like to see the world this way shallow oceanic water probably could have benefited from this just as much in things like coral reefs and uh, like mangrove swamps, things like that, uh, or cypress swamps. But for one reason or another, this occurred in freshwater. And now we know it occurred multiple different times. So this air bladder was uh, found in a fish in the ocean, uh, and it had a bony link from the air bladder to the uh, sensory nerve at the back of the uh, brain stem. And this bone section is actually an adaptation of the fish's ribs. And there's one that handles kind of deeper bass noises that's more in the range of oceanic fish traditionally. And it actually senses the, the sound waves and pressure waves moving through the water, whereas the other bone are just like the stylus on a record player and they read the vibrations or kind of the grooves incoming on the uh, air bladder as well as another little organ uh, and the lateral line nerve frequencies and vibrations and they then construct hearing as well as pressure mapping for fish so just like the modern zebra fish uh, these fish, it was modeled, they could hear all the way up to 15 hertz. So instead of 200 hertz, they could hear to 15 hertz. And that is a far wider hearing range with a far higher upper limit of hearing than the oceanic fish. Now in the fossil of 
Acronychthes macanoji <laughs> modeling has showed us that its Weberian ossicles would have peaked in sensitivity right between 500 and 1000 hertz, indicating that high frequency hearing was already on its way in this ancient lineage of this fossil that's already 67 million years old. So it was already developed and sorted all the way back then before the dinosaurs even died out. And this tells us that, that these fish transitioned into freshwater, one of their evolutionary tools that they had developed in salt water, which was this ability to uh, sense pressure and things out in the water at much higher frequencies. So it may be that there were shallow oceanic fish species that did have these abilities at one point, uh, but now those fish are gone, any living ancestors, and they're all freshwater fish. So this begs us the big question of today's video, which is, so when the heck did fish move from the oceans back to fresh water? And the traditional view was that single marine fish made one move from salt water into fresh water 180 million years ago. And from that event came all autofusion fishes, which later accounts for 70% of the different species of bony fish that are out there in the different lineages today. However, the new research suggests otherwise, and the brand new study just published out of UC Berkeley under uh, the paleontology department and Professor Juan Louis found that the ancestor of the autofusion fishes were in fact marine and not freshwater, meaning that there was one, multiple fish that made it from the ocean into the freshwater and then diverged after that point, and there were multiple independent transitions from marine into freshwater and not just one as previously assumed. This also means that the transitions likely happened later than previous belie previously believed and that they probably actually occurred around 154 million years ago during the late Jurassic. So dinosaurs were around and in peak dinosaurage. Uh, and this was after the supercontinent of Pangaea had already began to break up, which is interesting because when mapped out, we see that these fishes are on all sorts of continents all over the world, and all different sizes of fish have this Weberian apparatus. So why does this matter at the end of the day? Well, because multiple transitions into freshwater habitats accelerated diversification in all these new habitats. And new sensory capabilities of hearing and sensor sensory abilities of sensing pressure really, really help explain why these autofusion fishes are so highly diverse, like why it is in so many types of fish. It was a good system. And even though just like flight has evolved in mammals like bats, it's evolved in insects, it's evolved in birds, you know, just like that has evolved independently, a good idea gets used again by evolution, so to speak. And a good idea got used several times in this exact same way when we look at how fish evolved these hearing and pressure sensing abilities. So beyond the change in the evolutionary timeline, uh, it is a newly held belief that now at least two different origin species had to be there transitioning from ocean to freshwater, at least two, if not more than that. And the other large takeaways are that evolution is not a single event, but branching events. The freshwater takeover by these fish didn't happen just once as previously thought happened multiple times. And it's a reminder that sensory innovations, evolutionary innovations, and biological innovations matter hugely and enable all new lines of fish to exploit new habitats and new niches in their ecosystem. And in this case, it allowed them to colonize an entirely new world of water. So biogeology matters at the end of the day, and biogeology is a long-term study of the changes in land masses over time and their impact on life and evolution. The movement of the continents, changing ocean, the earthquakes, the volcanoes, the massive role of how geology and the actual earth, inanimate, non-living forces, impact life and how it radiates and adapts across earth and 
Along with that is the fossil record. If it weren't for these well-preserved, one-off, one-in-a-billion-chance fossils, we wouldn't know these things. So we need to keep looking and keep an eye out for these things, as well as keep re-examining old fossils in our museums and stored away so that we can continue to rewrite history with amazing new details like those found in this recent computer modeling done on this recent fossil. So to sum everything up before I close out, a tiny little fish 67 million years ago caused big waves in our understanding of freshwater fish evolution. The discovery of Acronychthes machigonois, guys, it's really hard. It's Acronychthes M A C C A G N O I apostrophe S machigonois. Uh, its Weberian apparatus shows that the ancestors of today's fish were almost identical to the fish living during the dinosaurs in fresh water, in remarkable ways, in several different groups that made independent attempts to enter fresh water. So, even back then, a hundred million years ago, they managed to successfully colonize and invade freshwater habitats, not once but at least twice. So if you enjoyed diving into this evolutionary biology story, please hit that like button. Subscribe for more content. Become a member if you want to get over 200 audio episodes free. And please drop a comment. What other evolutionary assumptions have been rewritten recently in history or science? Do you think science... Do you think we have it correct this time that we know... Uh, you know, something of a ground level of knowledge? Or do you think we're still just at the very beginning of understanding how uh, evolution and things work? I'd love to hear your input on that. So thanks again for watching, you guys. And as always, take care. I will definitely see you next time. Have a good one. Bye.